celebrate right now. Sydney is two and a half years cancer free. Let's go. Love it. Powerful. Man, I, um, there's just so much about that story that just moves me to tears. Uh, but catch that last part, that for them, church went from unfamiliar to family. That's why we say all the time that church is not an event that you attend. It's a family that you belong. And, and, and I know family is a strong word. I, I know for some of you, family doesn't resonate good thoughts. Or some of you feel like, how could I belong with my past, with my lack of knowledge, with what I've been through, with my doubts, my skepticism? And I know you don't trust us because trust needs to be earned. I just want you to know, hear it from me, that, that you belong right here. It doesn't matter what you come from, what you believe. You don't have to believe with us before you belong with us, that you belong. So I guess what I'm trying to say is welcome home. So let's welcome in everybody today. Welcome home, those watching online as well. We're grateful to have you. So I wanna... I wanna wanna take a moment, I wanna pray for us today. Let's just do that as we continue our time together. And I just encourage you, just just take a deep breath in. I know I've been here since 6.30 this morning and you just got here. And so I'm just praying in these moments that your heart is ready now to receive for what the Lord has for you. Take a moment, think about all the things that you're worried about, the things that are on your mind that are pressing. And I'm not asking you to ignore it. I'm just asking you to see it in the hands of your sovereign God. And I want you to hear my words and let it penetrate your heart that you are God's beloved, not because of anything you do or you produce. You're not a factory worker working on a line. You are his son, his daughter. You are always welcome to the table, never excluded. I can say that in confidence because the tomb is empty. Sin has been forgiven. Restoration has been restored. So Lord God, we come today now to receive the God of heaven who lavishly loves his kids. God, may you open up our hearts. May they be tender so that we can walk out never changed. Father, we want you to get the glory in this place. We love you. Amen. Amen. Well, if you got a Bible, let's grab it. Get your Bibles. Let's go to Nehemiah. Today, chapter two, Nehemiah chapter two, if you're first time guest with us, you're in episode three of a, of a series we started through the book of Nehemiah, um, a conversation that we're just calling Kingdom Builders. So as you're finding your way to Nehemiah chapter two, I want to start off by making a statement. And I need to warn you, this is going to be highly offensive, extremely controversial, and definitely politically incorrect, but it needs to be said. Okay, here we go. Fall is overrated. (laughs) I said it. I did it. Come on. Anybody agree? All right. Nine of you on this side. I love it. Oh, this is great. Uh, I know. I know. Listen, this is, I told you it was going to be offensive. All right. I warned you. Uh, Now, for some of you, you're like, I just can't believe you said that. I mean, my goodness, you just ruined my entire morning. Like fall's your jam. It's what you live for. You, You survived the other three seasons to get to this moment right here. Like fall is all about pumpkin spice and Jesus Christ. It's, you have the shirt, you have the shirt. It's flannels and football and bonfires. Fall is meat slowly cooking on the Traeger grill with college football in the background. It's MLB baseball playoffs, go Braves. It's hay rides and pumpkins. Listen, I love all of those things, okay? I actually think the weather in heaven is gonna feel like fall every day. I do. I think the the dress code in heaven is going to be a hoodie and shorts. Come on, that's angelic. That's heaven. I didn't say I didn't like fall. To my defense, I said, I think it's overrated. Now, before you're like, I can't attend this church any longer. I I can't believe this. Pastor doesn't like fall. What else don't you like, huh? The Bible? (laughs) Prayer? Billy Graham? I mean, where does it end? All right. (laughs) allow me to plead my case in the courtroom of your judgment because I feel it right now. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what I'd like to present to you today, the evidence of why fall is overrated is simply because in the South, the majority of this season is what I call fake fall. 
Because you know how it is by the time midsummer takes place in the south, I mean mid-September in the south, you're done with summer. The hot, humid humidity, you long for the days where you can walk outside and not instantly start sweating at 7 a.m. And you're gonna get those cool mornings in mid-September and you're gonna get all giddy, it's fall, and you're gonna put on your flannel and you're gonna change out the wreath on your door and your house is gonna look like a pumpkin patch. The only problem is throughout the day, it's like God dials up the temperature on the oven and by 3 p.m. it's 90 degrees outside. So then when it finally consistently gets cool, kind of like this weekend, you only got about three weeks until the first weekend in November where we still observe an ancient tradition that no longer applies to our standard and way of living called time change. Where for the next 4.5 months, may I remind you, you're gonna lose an hour of sleep. Everyone's, I mean, an hour of sunlight. Everyone's gonna be depressed. They're gonna stay inside of their house. And by the way, winter is right around the corner. Therefore, men and women of the jury, Upon the information rightly and accurately stated in front of you, I thereby conclude fall is overrated. <laughs> Anybody want to join the cause? Come on. Okay, we're off to a great start. <sighs> Here's the reality. Um, it doesn't, <laughs> some of you are like, what's happening? It doesn't really matter what I think about the season of fall. The, the, the truth is what's taking place in the earth right now is that the seasons are changing. That summer gives way to fall, fall will give way to winter, winter to spring, and spring back again to summer. That if there's anything constant in this life, it is the changing of the seasons. Now, you might not make the spiritual connection, but, but I do, because Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 told us this. He said that there is a time for everything. There's a season for every activity under heaven. So there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. There's a time to build and there's a time to scatter. There's a time to rejoice and there's a time to mourn. Solomon is teaching us a biblical principle that the rhythm of life is marked by seasons because God operates in seasons. Now, I find great comfort in knowing this about God. Because the seasons of my life that feel chaotic, out of order, random, like it's really good to know that when my life is all over the place, God's not all over the place. But rather like a game of chess, God's always four four steps ahead of you. Matter of fact, right now, God is in your winter working things out while you're stuck in fall. God is already ahead of you in your spring, producing harvest and new opportunities while you have to wade through the cold of winter. That when my life seems out of order, God right now is tethering all things together for my good. The question is, can you be faithful in whatever season God has you in? Because what you're allowing to influence and shape you in this season will determine who you're gonna be in the next. So church, the motto that I live by, this is my personal motto, My motto is, if I got to go through it, I might as well grow from it. (laughs) My God, that's my motto. Hey, if I got to walk through this season that feels like the valley of the shadow of death, you better believe I'm taking everything out of it that God intends for me to get. I'm not wasting this season. Who's this for today? I'm I'm not wasting this trial. I'm not wasting this situation. If I got to walk through death or divorce or infertility or mental health, whatever it is, God, I'm taking everything that you're trying to get to me to grow me into the person you want me to be. Who am I preaching to today? Because I feel like God wants me to ask, wants me to tell somebody, stop wasting a season just because it doesn't look like what you thought. God is very intentional with where he has you right now. The question is, are you being intentional with God where he has you right now? So as the leaves turn colors and fall to the ground, may we pay attention to the seasons of life that we're in. Nehemiah and the nation of Israel are in the middle of a season change. You're going to see throughout this study that there are three major shifts or seasons that Nehemiah goes through. You'll see him go from a cupbearer to a general contractor to uh, ultimately a governor. And so we're just acknowledging in this series, Kingdom Builders, that as a church, we feel like the Lord is preparing us for a new season. That right now we're in a season of preparation that ultimately is kind of merging to November the 12th, where the people of God are going to make a commitment so that next year we can enter into a season of building and expansion. If you you haven't heard, about a month ago, I announced that we're going to finish, Lord willing, next year, uh, phase three of this campus, something we started about six years ago. And and it's why, as your spiritual tour guide, that's kind of really kind of what I feel like I'm doing, is I'm just helping you take steps. 
Because on November the 12th, I'm asking every family, every individual to prayerfully consider making a two-year financial commitment over and above your regular giving. And 100% of that will go to Kingdom Builders, which is going to fund phase three. So a step that I encourage you, if you haven't done it already, is attend one of our uh, last two vision nights. You can see the dates behind me here coming up on uh, October the 15th, and then again on Wednesday, October the 18th, and you can text the word vision on the screen right there. Uh, we had our very first kickoff one last Sunday, and man, if you were here, it was, it was incredible. It explains a little bit of that mural out there in the lobby. Uh, we're talking about the project, breaking it down. You get to ask questions. And of course, in LifePoint fashion, we got, we got some fun surprises for you. Uh, so if you are pre-registered already for the next two, I can't wait. Just get ready. I can't wait for you to experience it. If you haven't done it yet, grab your phone right now, check your fantasy league, make sure you're not starting Joe Burrow. I'm a realist, y'all. I'm a realist. Text the word. Come on, do it right now. Text the word vision to the number on the screen. It's going to give you a form. Just, just go ahead and do it. And you get to select the hoodie or crew neck that you want. We're giving you a gift for free just for showing up. And again, let me remind you, you're not, you're not committing to anything. This is just you saying, I'm curious about the things of God. God, God, how could you use me to be a part of building your kingdom? And, and so we're studying the book of Nehemiah on Sunday mornings, but with Great about this, honestly, not, is not just what takes place here, but also through our Kingdom Builders journey, journey, Journal Guide. If you didn't grab one of these, our team did a phenomenal job. They took the uh, Old Testament book of Nehemiah, broke it down into daily Bible reading plans. Uh, there's self-guided prayers as well. So grab one of these on your way out today and, and start growing deeper in your faith with Christ. So um, Nehemiah is this incredible leader. And really what he's doing, he's showing us what it looks like to be a Kingdom Builder. Uh, week one, he showed us that kingdom builders care. Like, the simple truth is, if you don't care, you're not going to get involved, right? L let me frame it like this. You are already involved at the level in which you make time to care. I don't think for a lot of us, it's that you don't have the heart to care. I just wonder, do you have the time to care? Kingdom builders care. Last Sunday, part two, kingdom builders pray. Man, for four months, Nehemiah wept, prayed, and we just said, look, if we want to see revival break out in our families, if we want to see revival break out in our kids, in our communities, in our school, dare I say our nation, it has to break out in here first. Like God isn't going to do anything significant through you until he first does something significant in you. So we pray. Part three today, he's going to show us kingdom builders make a plan. So if you take notes today, uh, open up your journal guide. I'm going to speak to you from this thought right here, a plan on purpose. A plan on purpose. I just feel like my assignment is to help align your plans with God's purpose. Because it's actually possible that you're executing plans for your life that don't include the purposes of God. And if your life doesn't have God's purpose on it, it'll never fulfill you. I'm going to go ahead and spoiler alert. I'm going to get to the end of your life. It doesn't matter how much money you make, what experiences you do, who you got to meet, the titles that you accomplished. If God's purposes are not a part of it, it will not fulfill you. Just look to Hollywood. Look at mental health. Look at depression. Look at suicide. God's purpose has to be a part of your life. And Nehemiah today is going to help shape us. What does it actually look like to live a life of purpose. So I'm gonna take this big concept and Nehemiah is gonna help us break it down into these four things. So if you want the syllabus, this is where we're going. Kind of four elements of a plan that has purpose. So let's start here today. Nehemiah chapter two, starting in verse one. If you're ready, shout, I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, here we go. Verse one, the month of Nisan in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes. When wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Nehemiah, why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of the heart. So this is it. The first part of a plan on purpose, write this down, number one, is personal conviction. Like the purposes of God for your life are almost always tied to a personal conviction. And a personal conviction is different for all of us. But here's the theme that is constant. Uh, personal conviction, it's that thing that you think about and it just breaks your heart. Like if you think about it long enough, it will literally begin to move you to tears. That's a personal conviction. For Nehemiah, he's moved to tears four months praying and fasting in chapter one because after 150 years of exile, the nation of Israel is returning back to Jerusalem. Now, 
to understand this 150 years before this moment, King Nebuchadnezzar, who's a featured character in the book of Daniel, comes into Jerusalem, and before he exiles Israel, basically making them slaves, he burns the city to the ground. I mean, like, tears down the church. I'm not superstitious, but I'm not about to burn a church down, all right? I'm a little stitious. Michael Scott, the office. Anyways, um, like, burns the thing down, tears down the walls, and exiles the nation. So for 150 years, this has been Israel's story. So Nehemiah finds out that um, King uh, Artaxerxes, who's the Persian king who overtook the Babylonians, is allowing Israel to go back. They go back in three waves. The first wave is led by Zerubbabel. He helps rebuild the temple. Then Ezra, Ezra uh, reestablishes temple practice and worship. And now the third remnant is getting ready to head back to Jerusalem. And Nehemiah can't stand the thought that they're going back to a broken, fractured city. This is no place to raise a family. This is no place to raise the next generation. The, the, the government is godless. The nation is weak and frail because they have no walls to actually protect them. And Nehemiah starts to realize God is burdening me to be a part of this solution. And that's it. Your, per, your purpose is almost always tied to a personal conviction, that thing that begins to break your heart. When I, when I think about this, I think of Beth White right here at Life Point. Now, you may not know Beth Uh, by her name, but you've probably seen her. She's probably greeted you on the way in. She serves in multiple capacities here in the church. But one of her personal convictions is why she is one of the key leaders in Celebrate Recovery. So CR is a ministry that we do right here on Friday nights, the lifeline that has worship and food, and then they break off into small groups. It's a recovery ministry for anybody that's battling addiction, habits, hurts, rehab. Celebrate Recovery is your place. Every Friday night, jump in right here. But the reason why Beth is so passionate about this is because it came from a place of her pain. She gave me permission to share this. One of her daughters ended up losing her life because of addiction. A week later, her son-in-law overdosed. So what was pain in one season has now become a personal conviction in the next. I think of Jesse Wolfram at LifePoint. Jesse, who serves on our ERT, emergency response team, he told me this, he said, I grew up in LA, and when I was 13 years old, my parents divorced. I immediately turned to the drug culture. Over time, started dealing drugs, working my way up inside of that chain. I knew people who were constantly in and out of prison, and I knew that if I didn't make a change, that was my future. By the grace of God, I met Christ, I met my now wife, and now twice a year for the last seven years, through a partnership with Kairos Ministries, I get to go into the prisons and share my story of rescue and redemption. Come on, isn't, isn't that awesome? Like that's, that's what this looks like. That, that's, why, that's why when I say things like don't waste your season, that's what this means because what often is pain in one moment in the hands of, rede- of a redemption God can become your very purpose in the next. What is that thing that breaks you. Now, he, let me help you. Um, here's how you know that you have a personal conviction, all right? One of the ways you know is that it will not just be emotion. So the evidence of the presence of God in your life is not just emotion. If it was only emotion, um, it wouldn't take much to move you. Look, I did youth ministry for seven years before I got into the adult gig, and I did a lot of camps, a lot of retreats, Look, if emotion was the indicator of the presence of God, all you need is a week away from your parents, sleep deprivation, and a lot of Mountain Dew. (laughs) You give me those three things, I could right now get you to rededicate your life to Santa Claus. (laughs) Emotion is not the greatest indicator of the presence of God in your life. You know what it is? Rearrange priorities. If it's just emotion, the emotion will wear off and nothing will lead to action and nothing will change. But I'm telling you what, man, when God gets a hold of your life and you can't stand looking at poverty or unborn babies or sex trafficking or, or, or whatever it is in, 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 that, that begins to break your heart, you begin to rearrange your priorities. You spend your time different. You spend your money different. You look at your job different. You look at your community different. Because the greatest indicator of the presence of God is your priorities will begin to change. Yeah, yeah, personal conviction. Nehemiah's priorities are changing. He's no longer fulfilled and being satisfied with being the king's cupbearer. Things are about to change. Look at the second thing here he's gonna do. And number two is leverage your position. So it starts with a personal conviction. Then I begin to leverage my position right where God has me. 
So if you read verse one a second ago, it said that Nehemiah was bringing wine to the king when the king noticed that he was very sad. Nehemiah was not a butler. He was not a glorified servant. He was what is called a cupbearer to the king. Now, again, for us today, that could get lost because there's not a political office that somebody runs and we elect an official to be the cupbearer to the president. So in order to get this, we got to go back a little bit into ancient times. Uh, in, in ancient times, the cupbearer was one of the most trusted advisors on the inside of the king's inner circle, mainly because uh, the greatest threat of assassination for a king was not someone on the outside. It was someone on the inside. It wasn't a neighboring nation trying to take them over. They could see that coming. No, 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 no. It was one of his own trying to stage a coup to overtake the throne. This is why kings all in the Old Testament were paranoid, crazy, trusted nobody. Uh, Saul was paranoid. David got paranoid. Solomon, because everybody was trying to take their throne. Now, if you were trying to uh, assassinate a king in a subtle way that wouldn't get traced back to you so that your political candidate could now become the throne leader, um, what better option than food poisoning? So this is what the cupbearer did. Literally, the cupbearer's job was to taste the king's food, drink the king's drink before he did, just to make sure it wasn't poisoned. This is an awesome job until it wasn't. There's no such thing as like, I had a bad day at work today, babe. No, no, no. You had great days at work, and then you just didn't come home from work. That's how, that's how this thing worked. I mean, can you imagine every single night? It's like eating at Steak 48. I'm talking the best of drink, the culinary artists, it's perfection, like food delicacies that only got to offer before the king. You got to eat it. What a job. Yet, with every bite, you're, you're risking your life. Oh, the cupbearer had the ear and the heart of the king, traveled with the king. Now, don't forget, Nehemiah is a Hebrew exile. So the right-hand trusted official to the king of Persia wasn't a Persian. Th this tells us so much about Nehemiah without ever knowing about Nehemiah. It tells us that as a second generation, maybe third generation Hebrew exile, he was a man who lived under the authority of God in a pagan nation. Never bowed a knee to compromise, was trustworthy, honored the king, uh, kept his Hebrew identity intact, worshiped the one true God in the midst of all the, the uh, immorality that surrounded him. And, and I think the reason why Nehemiah was able to serve the king and was able to earn his way up and get noticed by the king in a pagan culture is because he knew that Artaxerxes was a king under the king. Look, it doesn't matter today how godless our government gets. When you know that you are under the king of kings and the Lord of lords, then does it really matter who sits in the Oval Office at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue when you know the king who sits on the throne of heaven? Come on, if you really believe that, then followers of Jesus should be the best law-abiding citizens who vote, who take responsibility, and who honor those above us. Wow, we could learn something from him. So Nehemiah is having this like aha, full 360 moment as he realizes, I think the whole reason why I'm the cupbearer's king and the reason why I've been in this position is now to leverage it for the purposes of God. Man, when your life is on purpose and has the purpose of God on it, you, you start to look at your job and you go, man, I don't, I'm not just making a paycheck. I'm not just running a business. God, you have, I'm not just going to high school or, or, or off in an internship. God, you have me here for a specific purpose. It doesn't mean that you need to quit your job and go join the ministry because purpose is only on the mission field or working for a nonprofit. No, no, no. Purpose is not something you go to. Purpose is something you bring with you. And kingdom builders begin to look at my life, my affluence, my influence from a different perspective. Nehemiah is leveraging his position. Look at verse two again. So the king asked me, dude, what's wrong with you, man? I haven't seen you like this. You've been my right hand forever. Your face looks so sad when you're not ill. Uh, this can be nothing more than sadness of the heart. And here's Nehemiah's response. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Do you notice this? I was very much afraid. Look, when you're living on purpose for Christ, You've got to get comfortable with the emotion of fear. Wherever faith is required, 
fear will be present. Look, the opposite of faith is certainty. If everything in your life is certain and you got it and you can control it, then you don't need faith. But every single time God calls you to level up, you better get used to fear. Fear and faith coexist together. And Nehemiah is, this brother is scared. And church, he had every right to be scared and only one reason not to be. So if you ever study um, Persian empires, which I know you have a life, why would you do that? I need you to study that for me. So Persian empires will show you that, that the, the kings were, I mean, brutal. I mean, absolutely inhumane. Uh, I'm not gonna get graphic today, but historians have documented that one of the war tactics of a king when they would capture their enemies is they would cut off both of their legs, one of their arms, so that they could shake the hand of their victim while mocking them as they bled to death. These kings were brutal. Not to mention, this is Susa. Susa today is modern day Iran. So you have a Hebrew exile making demands from a terrorist dictator. Of course he was afraid. Nehemiah has seen the king give these orders and murder people for far less. I mean, with this one request, his life was literally on the line. And he's showing us something very important that if you're gonna be a kingdom, here's the third thing, you have to activate your faith. Church, you gotta activate your faith. Personal conviction, you, you, you gotta start leveraging your position, but at some point you gotta activate your faith. Yeah, yeah, faith is about full dependency on Jesus. If you want your faith to grow, then you gotta do things that scare you. You gotta do things in your life where you're like, Lord, if you don't show up, I don't know if this is gonna work out. God, I'm fully surrendered, fully stepping out. I don't have it all. I don't have all the X's and O's grafted on the, on the pie chart correctly because God, I need you to intervene. Faith is full dependency on Jesus. It's why Hebrews 11 verse six, I believe it is, says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's interesting. Out of everything the writer could have said, Without obedience, without morality, good works. No, no, without faith, it's impossible to please God because faith is what deepens your dependency on Christ. Full trust. By the way, um, that's the goal of discipleship. Full dependency on Christ. That's the goal of church. This experience right now, the purpose is not church. We give but the purpose isn't to give. We serve, but the purpose isn't to serve. It's for total dependency on Jesus. And it's possible that you can sit in a church and you can sit in a pew for decades and your dependency is growing for the pastor, but not for the savior who actually saved you. I got it. I got this one. I can't save you. Don't let your dependency grow on me more than it's growing on your savior. So, so faith, it's, a, it's, a, it's the muscle of Christianity. The way that your physical body produces muscles, it has to break down under tension, the old muscle so that a stronger one can rebuild. It's the same thing with faith. That the more you step out, the more you begin to see God show up. I think, honestly, church, that's what I'm most excited about November the 12th, that Commitment Sunday. It's because I know for the next two years, like God's gonna shape and stretch you in ways that maybe you've never allowed him. Because I think one of the ways that we often don't give, trust God fully is in the area of our finances. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, just look at me like I'm talking to somebody else. It's like, it's like, no, nah, God, I trust, you in all, I trust you in all these other areas of my life. But hey, when it comes to money, why don't you sit this one out? I got it. I got it. And God's like, no, 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 no. I'll never give you a life where I'm not needed. If this doesn't scare you, then you're probably not stepping out in the way that God wants you to. Nehemiah is scared to death and only one reason not to be, and that's his God. So here's his moment. Look at verse four. The king says to him, what are you asking for? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Life point, this is his moment. This is everything that he had been weeping and fasting for for the last four months. Is Nehemiah gonna take his shot? No doubt with his hands shaking, the brow of his head pouring down with sweat, his eyes go from the king's feet all the way up and looks at the king straight in the eyes. And here's his moment. Look at verse five. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king and your servant has found favor in his sight, 
Let me send him to the city of Judah where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. The king with the queen sitting right next to him said, well, how long do you plan to be gone? How how long do I need to expect my cupbearer to be gone? And when are you gonna get back? Well, it pleased the king to send me, so I set a time. I also said to him, if it pleases the king, I have a letter to the governor of Trans-Euphrates so that they will provide safe conduct until I arrive in Judah. And I have a letter to Asaph, keeper of the royal park, so he will give me timber to make the beams for the gates of the citadel and the temple and for the city and the walls and the residence that they're occupy. And because the gracious hand of my God was upon me, the king granted me this request. So I went to the governors of Trans-Euphrates and I gave them the king's letter. The king had also sent army officers and cavalry with me. Look, I just, just imagine the boldness of this request, all right? He goes to a terrorist dictator and he looks at him and he says, um, sir, uh, I would like to request a full year off, fully paid. Number two, a reference letter because where I'm going, I'm gonna work a second job. And number three, uh, we need the wood from your forest because you have the, le- the best lumber all around, AKA I need you to fully fund the reconstruction of this city that's been destroyed. The, the magnitude, this, the audacity, the, the courage of Nehemiah. I mean, he's not just asking for a couple weeks vacation and a couple bucks in his pocket. He's going all in. You know why? Here's the fourth element of a plan on purpose. You gotta live a life with no regrets. Oh, he knows this is it. I'm probably gonna die. Yet he lived a life with no regrets. If I'm asking, I'm going all in. If I'm believing, I'm believing big. Either God's going to do this or my life is going to end. And life point, I want to encourage you today to, to remind you that you only get one shot at this life. This is it. You get one shot, take your shot. I don't want you to look back when you're 80, 90 years old and think, man, I really wish I would have. Man, I wish I would have done that for God. I want you to, like Nehemiah, take advantage of the opportunity that's right in front of you. I love this quote by an author, Leonard Ravenhill. He goes like this, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. Isn't that good? The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. In other words, opportunities have an expiration date. The opportunities that God is putting in front of you have a shelf life. And if you do not seize them in the lifetime of the opportunity, the opportunity will come and it will go. Um, Nobody knew this better than a man by the name of Ronald Wayne. I don't expect anybody to know who this man is, but I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this small little garage Silicon Valley tech company that he helped start. The company's called Apple. Have you heard of it? Now, most people don't know Ronald Wayne. They actually accredit Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak as the two co-founders of the company Apple. But if you'll do the research and look back, you'll realize that there was actually a third founder. Matter of fact, Ronald Wayne was brought in, and I quote, to provide adult supervision for 21-year-old Steve Jobs and 25-year-old Steve Wozniak. Uh, Ronald Wayne was the perfect person. Uh, he, he was older in his years, very successful, just left Natari, built an incredible company, business savvy, perfect investor. So Ronald Wayne drew up the plans for the agreement and he would give his services in exchange for 10% of Apple. Well, he only lasted 12 days because after 12 days, he saw the reckless spending of Steve Jobs and Wozniak And he realized that these two guys are out of control and this personal debt that they're accruing is somehow gonna fall back on me. So on April the 27th, 1768, Ronald Wayne sold his 10% share back to Apple for a measly $800. Do you know how much 10% of Apple's worth today? Let me help you. $280 billion dollars. He sold it for 800 bucks. The opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. Church, all I'm asking you is what opportunities is God putting in front of you? Step into that. Step into that. You know why? 
Because when you step out, heaven opens up. I've seen it over and over in my life. I've seen it over and over in other people. When you step out in faith, heaven opens up. So, so here's what faith is, all right? This is practical nine to five faith. You ready? Someone's taught me this. I want to teach it to you. Faith is simply doing the next right thing. That's it. Don't over-spiritualize it. Don't over-complicate it. What's the next right thing in front of you? Go do that. Because look, when I think about my life and I think about this church and I think about this ministry and I begin to think about the Tri-County Church Planning Network that we just launched back on Easter and how we have a mission to plant gospel-centered healthy churches in the three counties within a 20-minute driving radius of LifePoint because every county should have a a church within short driving distance of them. When I think about that and I think about phase three next year and the generational impact that it's gonna have and I think about multi-site one day and I think about the fact that we wanna see a, a, a mentor program in every elementary school in the city of Fort Mill because every child deserves to have an encourager and someone who believes in them. When I think about what we're doing in Honduras and we want to expand the house of blessing so that more kids can get rescued, when I think about that, it's overwhelming. So here's what I do. I just do the next right thing. That's it. So what's the next right thing? do that. That's what Nehemiah did. And you know why he did it? Look at verse eight. Because of his boldness, here's what it says. And the king gave me, oh God, you are good, what I asked for, because the good hand of my God was upon me. I'm telling you right now, when you step out for, yeah, you can clap for that. Heaven opens up. Why? Because the good hand of your God is upon you. He's He's using you and me, broken vessels, to carry out his mission. The question is, will you just do the next right thing? So Lord, all across this room, I thank you for your word. Holy Spirit, you don't need me to break down examples, God. Your spirit's working in the, in the lives and the hearts of your children right now. God, they know what their next right thing is. God, I just don't wanna look back on my life and, and, and think to myself, man, I wish I would've. I mean, if there's one thing I know to be true, I I can't take any of this stuff that I'm accumulating with me anyways. God, I wanna build your kingdom. I wanna make a difference. And just because I'm a pastor doesn't make my job more purposeful than a trash collector or a teacher or a realtor or a stay-at-home parent. Purpose is not somewhere we go. It's, It's what we bring with us. God, thank you for the invitation. So Lord, may we have the faith like Nehemiah that if we're gonna ask big, let's just ask big. Hey, let's just ask for our son who we've been praying for for years to come to faith. Hey, let's pray for cancer to dissolve. dissolve. Let's let's pray for our nation to be restored. Let's let's, let's pray for our schools um, to have a moment where people are coming to faith in you. I mean, if we're gonna ask big, let's ask big and watch you move. God, we give you the glory. Give us the courage now to do what the next right thing is. We love you. Amen. 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 Can we give it up for Pastor Nate?